Please stand for the reading of God's holy word. And on this first Sunday of 2015, God has given me a sermon series to preach on the prophecy of the Lord's return and the end of the age. And so this morning, our scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 24. And I will be reading verses 1 through 14 from the New King James Version. If everyone is there, would you please say amen? Amen. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you may be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended will betray one another and hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. I want to read that part again. But he, and listen to the but, but. He who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Wow. So then faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. You may be seated. My subject for this message this morning is signs of the last days or signs of the end times. Have you ever asked yourself when will Christ return? Or have you ever thought about when will Christ return? Because from one generation to the next, this question has been pondered and thought about time and time again. And as a Christian believer, the nearness, the proximity of Christ's coming provides the backdrop for everything the Christian does. Christ hasn't revealed exactly when he will come, but he has told us signs to watch for. Even though the time of his coming is unclear, the fact of his coming is certain. Amen. And Jesus said that certain events would signal the nearness of his coming. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be famines and earthquakes. Christians will suffer persecution for the sake of Christ. And false prophets will come and teach heresy, leading many people astray. Lawlessness will abound as people do what is right in their own eyes and the authorities will be unable to control crime. And because of lawlessness, people will become cynical. They will become distrustful and fearful and their love for others will grow cold. And Jesus said the signs of the end times will be like birth pangs and the pain of childbirth 
increases in frequency and in intensity. Jesus said that the presence of war or famine or false teachers doesn't mean that he's coming. He said these signs are merely the beginning. Jesus said that the frequency of wars, earthquakes, and crimes will increase until finally his return brings everything to a finish. The intensity of wars and famines and other human crises will also escalate and our day has seen everything Jesus spoke of reach unprecedented proportions. As Christian believers, if there was ever a time when we should be alert to Jesus' coming, it's today. Amen. And in understanding this passage, we have to be very careful not to read into this passage more than what Christ is saying or to miss what he's saying. A major fact to keep in mind is that the disciples thought that all three events, Jew Jerusalem's destruction, the Lord's return, and the end of the world would happen at about the same time. When Christ said that the temple would be destroyed, the disciples assumed it would happen at the same time that he returned and ended the world, thereby restoring the kingdom to Israel. But Christ gave no timetable. Christ didn't say when the three events would occur. What he did was give signs that will occur before the events. Signs that point toward his return, toward the end of Jerusalem and the end of the world. And it's important to keep in mind that most of these signs happen all through history. But there's this difference. Right before the end of Jerusalem and the end of the world, the signs increase and intensify. There will be a period known as the beginning of sorrows and a period launched by the abomination of desolation known as the great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world. An abomination of desolation is an indescribably evil, a horrible detestable thing that happens in the last days. And in these four verses, Christ gives at least nine signs of the last days. False messiahs, world violence, natural disasters, severe religious persecution, terrible apostasy, which is betrayal and division, turning away from God, the rising of many false teachers offering false hope, a great falling away, increasing sin and, and love growing cold, some enduring and being saved, and world evangelism. But Christ divides these nine signs into three sections. The beginning signs, the beginning of sorrows. The succeeding signs, personal threats and sorrows. And the promising signs, the result of faithfulness. And the word but in verse 13 points toward two signs that offer all the promise and hope a believer could ever desire. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. In fact, your salvation and witness are what you live for. And the fulfillment of both is promised in the last days. Amen. Verses 1 through 4 says, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left there upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, if you're listening, say amen. amen. Take heed that no one deceives you. 
It isn't the outward appearance that makes an object acceptable. It's what's on the inside. And the temple showed that this principle is even true with buildings because the glory of a building can be tarnished by what goes on inside of it. And the corruption of the priest within the temple stained its glory ever so greatly and so our perspective must be kept right and being honest and remembering two things will help us tremendously first not too many years from now all the glory and magnificence of the building if they are not destroyed by war or catastrophe will deteriorate and waste away and will lie as dust second within a short short time the human body itself even the most beautiful body will decay and be nothing more than dirt what Christ said happens. Thus all nine signs are bound to take place. But I want you to notice a critical point. The signs didn't happen because God destined them to happen. The signs happen because we sin. They come to pass because of the passion and evil that's within us. The world and every single person in the world should know by now what Jesus knew that the way of God is the only way. Every nation who walks its own way without God is doomed and every politician and man who walks his own way without God is also doomed and so when we look at the secret things of God when we look into the prophecies of the end time we must be very very careful and Christ gives a special warning not to let anyone deceive you Verse 5 says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Yes. And so the first sign of the last days is that of false messiahs. And Christ said, Many will come. There won't be just a few, but many false messiahs. Yes. And Christ said that these false messiahs will actually claim to be the Christ, the Messiah. They won't be the false prophets and teachers mentioned later. They will be people who claim to be the Messiah, the messenger of God to the world. They will be pseudo Christ, which means false Christ. Pseudo means false Christ or antichrist. And Christ said the false messiahs will deceive many. Amen. Not just a few, mm -hmm. but many will be deceived and follow the false messiahs, believing that they are the way, the truth, and the life of God. And yet in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. Every generation has its false messiahs, each one claiming to be the special messenger of God, the deliverer of the human race. Every false religion and sect of every generation has its false messiahs, but as the last days approach, there will be many. People seek utopia. They seek inward peace and outward security. Unfortunately, too many churches and too many believers don't demonstrate enough trust in Christ to show that peace and security are found in him and him alone. And so they turn to other messiahs, false messiahs. And verse 6 through 7 says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. And so the second sign of the end time is world violence. But 
believers will hear of so much violence that it will sound as though the world is coming apart. And believers can be troubled, extremely troubled over the news. But Christ said, see that you're not troubled. See that you're not disturbed, frightened, or confused. Because world violence can disturb and frighten. And it can lead us into confusion and commotion. But Christ says, such is not to be the case of his disciples. Because our hearts are to be fixed on God, trusting his presence, yeah. his care, and his security eternally. Yeah. And Christ said, world violence must come to pass. But violence doesn't happen because God wills or destines it to be. Violence happens because of the passions and evil of men's hearts. World violence can so dominate the news that we're led to believe that the end is at hand. But Christ has warned us that the end is not yet. Christ had just said, take heed that no one deceives you. All the violence that's been mentioned thus far deals with the violence that men hear about. But the fact of the violence is given in verse 7. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. A critical point that I want you to notice is that God doesn't cause violence. It's the passion and evil of men that causes violence. So who causes violence? Passion and evil of men. Yes. Besides, as believers, our hope is not in this world and neither is our real citizenship. Where is the believer's citizenship? Amen. Our hope and our life are in God and in heaven. And if God wasn't in heaven, then we would have no reason to have hope in heaven. Therefore, we're not to fear men and world events. Because men and world events can only take our lives, not our souls. Because our lives are in God's hands even to the end of the world. Verses 7 through 8 says, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And so the third sign of the last days is natural disasters. And three disasters of nature are mentioned in particular. Famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. In the last days, there will be terrible famine, and hunger can cause unbearable pain and terrible evil. And it's graphically described by Scripture. Lamentations chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, and I want you to listen just to what hunger can do for you. Those slain by the sword are better off than those who die of hunger. For these pine away, stricken for lack of the fruits of the field. The hands of the compassionate women have cooked their own children. They became food for them in the destruction of the daughter of my people. Now that's what hunger will do for you. Pestilences are deadly epidemic diseases like Ebola that we're experiencing now and even the flu. Whereas the rich man can sometimes escape famine mm -hmm. by purchasing food at any price, mm -hmm. they're helpless against pestilences or plagues because death by disease mm -hmm. and other natural causes show no partiality. Yeah. Pestilence will also be one of the terrible sufferings at the end time. Mm -hmm. And then there are earthquakes and unbelievable destruction and death is sometimes caused by earthquakes and during the last days of the earth earthquakes will occur in many places has anybody seen this already yes. famines pestilences and earthquakes all of these are the beginning of sorrows and the beginning of sorrows is like the beginning of birth pains it's like undergoing the labor of childbirth that involves hard physical effort over a long period of time 
Verse 9 says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And so the fourth sign of the end time is that of severe religious persecution. And Christ tells us what the persecution will be. And it will be affliction, killing, and hatred by all nations. And Christ tells us why believers are persecuted. For my name's sake. Believers are persecuted for Christ's name's sake. But this will be your opportunity to tell the rulers and leaders and all other unbelievers about Jesus. The point I want you to see is that for my sake means at least three things. Or to say it another way there are at least three reasons why the world often tries to silence and stamp out the believer. First, the world opposes the believer's standard of true godliness. The believer sets before the world a different standard and neither the world nor its standards are godly. Therefore, anyone who lives for the world and doesn't want to change his behavior by his very nature, he opposes the believer. Second, the world opposes the believer's life of purity and justice. And if you are a true, genuine believer, you live such a life. You actually live a life of purity and justice. You control your mind. You dressed modestly, you talk respectfully, and you behave justly. But the world lives to fulfill the lust of the flesh and to have whatever it is they want. And so as a believer, you're opposed by anyone who doesn't want to live a pure and just life. And third, the world opposes the believer's message of repentance and self-denial. Because the true, genuine believer proclaims the message of Christ, which is repentance and self-denial. And few people are willing to change. Few people are willing to repent to the degree that self is totally denied. Most people, even religious people, oppose the idea of giving all that you are and all that you have. But I want you to notice the words hated by all nations because this definitely points to persecution. The believer will be persecuted all around the world and Christ is looking to the persecution that will be launched against his followers across the centuries. Persecution that in the end time will be intensified. Verse 10 says, and then many will be offended will betray one another, and will hate one another. And so the fifth sign of the last days is terrible apostasy and betrayal and division. The act of rebelling against, forsaking, abandoning, or falling away from what you have believed. And Christ says many will be offended. Many will fall away. Person Persecution will cause droves of people to turn away from professing Christ. And that's because they don't know Christ. Not really, not personally, and not inwardly. They've only professed Christ with their lips. They haven't trusted Christ with their hearts. They haven't denied self or lived sacrificially. And neither have they given or served to meet the needs of the needy and of a dying world. They only know the comfort and benefits that rub off from being in church and in associating with the genuine believer. They know nothing at all about the call of God to share in the sufferings of Christ. Consequently, when the fiery trials come, they have no idea as to what it means to deny self and to die daily, daily, every day for Christ. They have no clue as to what it's all about and they have no inward desire or strength. Actually, they have no real reason to stand firm because they are offended, and so they fall away. Matthew chapter 13, verse 21 says, But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away. 
pray as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. But I want you to notice something else. Every generation has some apostasy. Some people who have professed Christ turn away from Christ. They fall away from Christ. They fall away from what they believed. And so what Christ is saying is that in the end time, apostasy will increase. It will be intensified. More and more people will just turn away from Christ. That many will be offended by the persecution that comes and they shall fall away. Christ said many will betray one another. Again, in the end times, telling on others, betraying people will intensify. Neighbor will turn against neighbor, friend against friend, family against family. And as believers, Christ has already warned us. He has warned his followers of terrible persecution and that we will even be betrayed by our own family. The difference in what Christ is saying now is that his stress is upon the end time. In the end time, the last days, persecution and betrayal will increase and intensify. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 2 says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, dangerous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. But have you ever thought of what it is that causes a person to betray other people? Because in the last days, all of this will be evident. And people betray people for many reasons. It may be to escape persecution, to save their own life, to secure some favor, to get what they want, or to get vengeance, to get back at someone. Or it could be to escape embarrassment or fear or to preserve selfish honor. But Christ said many will hate one another. Few people will be kind and tender and loving toward each other. In the last days, dissension, disagreement, and division will be strong. Most people will begrudge what someone else has or what someone else is doing or not doing. And this is the way it has been down through the centuries. Too often, the church has experienced one person disliking and opposing another person because of any envy, greed, concern for security, or recognition. Yes. All the sins of selfishness have caused too many people to stand against another person's position, beliefs, abilities, or leadership, and the list could go on and on. Yes. Unfortunately, criticism and judging, dissension, disagreement, and division among believers has been and is one of the most visible traits of the church. And Christ says that in the end times, such hatred will increase and intensify. But here's the question. Yes. Why are professing Christians sometimes offended by Christ? Could it be the fear of ridicule or abuse? Or maybe it's the fear of being ignored or not fitting in. Or could it be the fear of persecution or the fear of not having or the fear of losing position, security, wealth, and power? The point is this, all of these and many other reasons will be taking their toll in the last days. Think about what I'm saying because the two things that God and Christ desire from the believer above all else is love and unity. Because if we don't have love, we have fear. If we don't have unity, we have division. And for the true, genuine believer, love is basic and unity is basic. And yet many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Verse 11 says, Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And so the sixth sign of the last days is the rise of false leaders offering false hope. Christ said many false prophets will rise up and these prophets will claim to preach and teach the message of God. But each will have his own message.
message about how people can be saved. And a false teacher is one who develops his own way, his own truth in life for people to follow, rather than to follow Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. And the church has always had false teachers, teachers who present what they want instead of what Christ said, teachers who teach their own ideas instead of the truth of Christ, teachers who attach people to themselves instead of attaching them to Christ. And Christ said, many will be deceived. And people are deceived because their frantic hope for deliverance causes them to search for a savior. And in the process, they grasp at almost anyone who appears on the scene. As a human being, you have a desire to better and strengthen yourself and to impose and control your destiny, which causes you to look to leaders who offer you hope and a better world. And so the evidence of signs, wonders, power, reasonableness, logic, knowledge, and help causes you to follow leaders who demonstrate unusual abilities. And false teachers are both in the church and outside the church and sadly as we approach the last days of the world they will increase first john chapter 4 verses 1 through 3 says beloved do not believe every spirit but test the spirits whether they are of god because many false prophets have gone out into the world by this you know the spirit of god every spirit that confesses that jesus Christ has come in the fleshes of God and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God and this is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world if you are a true genuine believer you know how to pray and you know how to commune with God. You know how to receive strength from God and you know how to conquer and live above the most difficult circumstances. Yes, discouragement is a terrible thing because it defeats life, but there's one sure way to live above discouragement. Learn to live and walk in an unbroken communion with God every day. Study his word every day. Pray every day without ceasing. Learn and claim his promises every day because many false prophets will rise up and deceive you. Verse 12 says, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. This is still about apostasy. And so the seventh sign is a great falling away. Sin will increase. Love will grow cold and lawlessness will abound. And lawlessness, sin, and wickedness is always present. But there are times when it just seems to multiply and overflow. And in the last days of world history, it will also run wild and the love of many will grow cold. And there are at least five things that can dampen your love for God. And toward the end of the world, each of these things will be greatly intensified. First is self-seeking and worldliness. People will seek what they want and what the world offers instead of sacrificing and serving. People will just choose to satisfy their own desires and worldly urges instead of diligently seeking after God. Second is dissension or disagreement and division. And being discouraged and disheartened can cause confusion and the desire to flee. The desire to run, the, the desire just to travel in a different direction. Many people just cool off and back away because they want no part of anything that's divisive. Even if the truth is under attack, some people will withdraw rather than take a stand for the truth. Yes. Third is persecution. Unless you truly believe and trust in Christ, whatever affection you have for Christ will soon be dampened when you're questioned and opposed. Only a real belief and conviction will stand up under the ridicule and threat of death. Fourth is ignorance and weak faith. Some people
people go through a dampening of the spirit and affection simply because they can't understand why God would let such trials happen to them. And it's because there's no true understanding of man's sins and death. There's no true understanding of the world's corruption and destined end. And there's no true understanding of God's righteousness and promise of life. Therefore, when things are going bad and the world seems to be caving in on them, there's very little within them to stir a fervent, passionate, enthusiastic love for God. Fifth is lawlessness and immorality. Being around a crowd of people that live lawless and immoral lives will cause many people to lose their love for Christ and turn away from Christ. Revelation chapter 3 verse 16 says, Because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Christ warns the believer who lets his love grow cold. Verse 13, here we go. But... He who endures to the end shall be saved. If you want to be saved, if you want eternal life, then you don't quit on God. Amen. Thus the eighth sign is that of enduring and being saved. What I want you to get is that Christ is talking to his disciples. He's talking to believers. And so his promise of being saved is bound to mean the salvation of the soul in the last days. It couldn't mean the safety of human life because Christ has already said that some will be killed. Thus the believer who stands firm through persecution and hatred, through betrayal and division, and through false teaching, deception, lawlessness, and immorality, and you keep your fervent, passionate, enthusiastic love for God, you shall be saved. Amen. Very simply, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Thus, the ninth sign is world evangelism. And Christ says five very significant things. First, Christ says his gospel is the kingdom. But what kingdom? The kingdom of God that is spiritual and eternal. Second, Christ said his gospel is unstoppable. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached and no amount of trouble and failure can stop it from being preached. Neither will severe persecution or terrible apostasy. Neither will false teachers nor multiplied lawlessness nor the love of many growing cold. Nothing will stop the truth of the gospel from being preached. God's glorious word of grace will force its way over land and sea no matter what the strength of the storms and bodies may be that oppose it. Third, Christ said his gospel will be triumphant. This gospel will be preached in all the world. The gospel which has come to you as it is has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. The very tone of Christ's words point to the same sign of world evangelism. It points toward the end of the world. The uttermost part of the earth will be privileged to hear the gospel before the final appearance of Christ. I think that's a hallelujah. hallelujah. Fourth, Christ said his gospel is a witness. This gospel will be preached as a witness to all nations. The gospel as a witness is proclaiming the truth and the will of God for us. The gospel as a witness reveals the truth about us and our world. The gospel as a witness tells us where we came from why we're here and where we're going. The gospel as a witness
Jesus tells us what we've done, what we're doing, and what we should do. The gospel as a witness tells us why we are as we are, why we do what we do, and why we should do as God says. The gospel is a witness bearing testimony either for us or against us. The gospel is called a testimony. Amen. 1 John chapter 5 verses 11 through 12 says, And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. The gospel witnesses for you that you believe and are saved or the gospel witnesses against you that you don't believe and are condemned. Mark chapter 16 verse 16 says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Fifth, the end shall come when and only when the gospel has been preached in all the world. But I want you to notice something that's often overlooked. Christ doesn't say the gospel will convert the world. Don't we want the world to be converted? But that's not what God said. He said the gospel will... He didn't say that the gospel will be converted before the end comes, but rather the gospel will be preached to all the world before the end comes. All the world will not respond to the gospel, but all the world will hear the gospel. Christ does, however, give some indication of the results to expect from preaching the gospel. He said, for many are called, but few he didn't say many are chosen. Few are chosen. None of us know when the last day will be. But there is one question I want to leave with you today. When the last day does come, will you be ready? Because the last day will come. Let's praise God for his holy word today. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the signs that are going to occur before the last days.